Gotta Run. This is Will Sanchez. This is a very special show of Gotta Run. We're dedicating this show to the memory of Dave England, the uncle of my guest tonight, Stephen England. I heard about Stephen from Coach Terrence Skirchberg last year when he mentioned that Stephen was the fifth and final member of a team that set the Guinness Book record for a lettered marathon. Intrigued, I Facebooked Stephen England's name. To my surprise, there are dozens of Stephen Englands on Facebook. <laughs> Eventually, I found the right one. Stephen is a remarkable young man. He's more than just a fun guy that dresses up as Buzz Lightyear to entertain his friends. He's actually a diabetic ultra runner. Thank you, Will. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Stephen, let's get started by introducing yourself to our audience. For example, where were you born? A little bit about your family, something about your schooling. Okay, well, well, I was born in uh, England, just south of London, and uh, I have a sister, Helen, and uh, my mum and dad, obviously, and uh, we grew up in near London and then moved to Hong Kong for three years and then moved back to England in uh, 1990. And uh, I've been in the US for uh, about six and a half years now. Interesting, but before we jump into the US, your schooling, was it in Hong Kong or both? Combination of England and Hong Kong, both for me and my sister, so that was exciting. Really? Yeah. Hong Kong must have been very exciting. How old were you in Hong Kong? I was seven till I was ten, so uh, I think that was a, a big reason why I kind of live abroad and my sister works, which she travels a lot, so it kind of explains why we, uh, we're fairly independent and we like to see the world. As a youngster, were you guys athletically involved? Yes, uh, I played what I would call football, and everyone here would call soccer at a very young age. And the running really began after Hong Kong when I was 10. And my sister was the same. She was active in sports. Excellent. But then something happened that you got this diabetes. Well, that was a shock. <laughs> that, uh, that happened in uh, May of 94. Just turned 14. Just, I'd just been to a trip to Holland with my football team. And uh, apparently, I don't remember the story, my mum says that I came back from this trip looking pale and tired and after a few days of the same kind of symptoms we went to the doctor and they did a blood test and they said you should probably go to the hospital get this double checked but I think you have something serious and they said the uh, infamous words you have diabetes which I then collapsed on the floor and fainted and had no idea what that meant apart from it involved injections. Mm -hmm. We learned quickly what that meant and between myself, my mum and the rest of my family and my friends uh, started to understand it and started to manage it and, uh, and carry on a normal as life as, as I can live. Well, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, I'm not that familiar with diabetes other than is usually obese people get that or in danger of getting it? That's correct. Sounds like you were athletically, very athletically involved. Yeah, there's two types. The most common type is called type 2, which is people that are obese, uh, inactive, um, fairly unhealthy eaters. That's the majority of the people that have diabetes. There's about 22 million of those in the States and about 40 million that are actually pre-diagnosed, which is a really serious problem problem not just in America but in the world right now. Uh, type 1 is more for it comes along no one really knows why but it's more of a you get it when you're young as in, uh, it's about 5% of diabetes and it's where your pancreas just completely shuts down and the hormone insulin just doesn't get produced so when you eat your blood sugars rise and you would therefore be you become sick over a long period of time. Is it caused by an illness or is it genetic or is it any Cause. I'm the first one in my family tree, um, hopefully the last, but if, if not then we'll just we'll deal with it down the line. I don't blame anyone for it, I don't feel bad about it, uh, I, I'm always very, very positive and uh, I'm always say to myself, it could be something else, it, it could be, I could be blind, it could be something like cancer which we'll speak about later on or some, something else, so I always think there, there are worse things in the world to have, it's just, it's a manageable, manageable condition and uh, I take care of it and as you know I run a lot and uh, I stay healthy. As I mentioned in my opening remarks I, I looked you up on Facebook and, and about a year, a year and a half ago 
the buzz about you, you were winning or started to make a lot of noise in terms of these 50 Ks and 50 miles, you were coming in either first or placing it. So you certainly made a remarkable journey into that. Got to be daunting for a 14 year old, you know, you must have said, why me? You must have gone through a negative phase. I did, I did. I had the why me phase for my teenage years. Um, I kind of shut down for a number of years from, from the start and really, I did let my mum control it for me. I wasn't mature enough to really take it on board, so I give her a lot of credit for helping me through those years. Did your diet have to change? How did you manage it? Try and generally cut down a lot of sugars in the diet, so you're looking at the cardboard box of the cereal, like the nutrition facts, and seeing how many sugars are in there, and you're staying away from the frosties and those kind of things. It's, but it's really generally just having a healthy diet. It's not, it's not that hard to figure out. Okay. It's keep the salt down and keep the sugar down and, and choose healthy options. That's an option for everybody. Correct, yeah. <laughs> but you learn at an early age to really appreciate healthy eating because yeah. it, it made you feel better. Yeah, I had to. If I didn't cut down the sugars, then my blood sugars would go really high and I would feel lethargic, heavy, tired. Um, and then the opposite effect of diabetes is when you have not enough sugar and you feel shaky and weak and you're about to collapse. So there's a twofold to diabetes. Your, okay. The goal is to keep the sugars in the middle the whole time. You don't okay. want to be too low or too high. Obviously, you're an expert on your own condition. I am a semi-professional, yeah. Well, <laughs> almost professional. And your family, too, I would imagine. They yes, studied everything. They know a lot, too, yeah. What was your first big race that, you know, told you, wow, you know, this is the way, this is a lifestyle for me? I think it happened in two different phases. I mean, it, before diabetes, uh, after Hong Kong, there was an annual cross-country race in my middle school. I came back as the unknown kid from Hong Kong, and we, we did this race, and I, I, I won this race out of the blue. I don't remember the distance. I would guess about a mile and a half, two miles. It, okay. felt, it felt like a marathon at that age. <laughs> and then when I went to secondary school, the cross-country coach grabbed me, Mr. Manson, who's my, really my first ever running coach, and he'd heard about me, and I said I liked football. He says, no, you don't. You like running, and he dragged me across to the cross-country team. And then my second big win was winning the Surrey, which is the county in England, the Surrey Cross-Country Championships mm -hmm. uh, for the school. And I was the first person in that school to win it in about a 100-year history. Wow. This is when I was 12 years old. Oh, okay. So that, and then we had the diabetes thing, and it kind of got a bit tricky to manage it. And I mentally, I kind of wasn't as strong as I was before that. And I really look at the second phase as probably coming to America and I was running sometimes just to stay healthy and fit but not really looking for races or anything too serious and I watched the New York City Marathon in 07 and Paula Radcliffe my fellow Brit won the, f the women's race and I, I watched her in about two or three spots and uh, I'd heard of Nike Run Club and I'd never gone I was like oh I don't want to run with people I like running on my own so Paula wins, and I said, okay, I'm gonna go to Nike next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I met people like Kevin Starks, who was my pacer that night, and Worku, and Francis, and I guess the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> history for you, but news to us. What was the next step, the next big run for you? So in 09 was my real next big race. Um, I had run a marathon by then, I'd run London in 04, for juvenile diabetes as my charity. Uh, didn't go very well. Uh, <laughs> had a really bad hypoglycemic attack, which is where I have low blood sugar. I had to walk about two miles, crying and sobbing a little bit about how bad it was going. So that was a bad experience of running. Uh, and I wanted to redeem myself with my second marathon. Uh -huh. And I did a BQ, a Boston qualifier. I did about 301. In New York? In New York in 09. Interesting. Now, while you're running, do you have to be more careful in terms of measuring your your blood sugar as you run? I do blood tests every day and several times a day. And when I when I run, I, I do one before I exercise or before I race. And I'll see the level it's at and I'll decide how much Gatorade or gels I need to take at the start and how many I'm going to probably take during the course of, of the race. Interesting. And then at the end of the race, I'll then go to my bag, if I can find it in the New York bag check, <laughs> and uh, I'll do a, a post-race blood test just to make sure that I'm 
okay, I'm kind of in the middle. What's involved in the blood test? It's a meter, it's like an electronic meter, and uh, you, you prick your finger, you get a, a drop of blood, and you squeeze the finger, and you put it on a test strip, and it's five seconds countdown, uh -huh. and there's the magic number. It tells you your, your gl uh, blood glucose level. Okay, you're looking for a certain range and you... Yeah, and a normal person would be between around 80 and 110. My range can be, I've seen it as low as 40, I've seen it as high as 450. Okay. So it's a real big range. Okay. How do you make an adjustment to make sure you're, you're safe? By um, taking in more, something like a Gatorade, which is a fast-acting uh, carbohydrate, uh -huh. like a simple carbohydrate. Or if I'm too high, I would take in more insulin, which would break down the glucose and bring my level down. I've been on an insulin pump for about a year, which uh, actually gives me much better control. Um, I just have a catheter that I stick in my stomach and um, I change it every few days. And when I eat, I pump insulin in and I have a, a, a basal level, which is like a constant drip. So it goes, it's just constantly going in 24 seven. And I can adjust that so easily. It's, it's, it's crazy wow, technology. That is, that is crazy. Now, this is a lifetime condition? It is, it is. Um, I don't view it as anything less. Um, I've spoken to my doctor, Dr. Uh, Goland at uh, Naomi Berry Diabetes Center in, at Columbia University. She's my new endocrinologist and she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we, we both agree there's no point in dreaming of a, of a cure because it's just, there's, you just be let down every time you hear of a maybe, yeah. a maybe cure. You, you hear of pancreas transplants or some patch you put on your arm. These are all tests right now, mainly done in Europe, but I don't get my hopes up. I, okay. I'm, and I'm actually fine about it. I'm actually happy being diabetic and I'm actually now very proud to be diabetic and show other people that you can be fit and have a normal life. Interesting. There, there have been other sports figures that dealt with diabetes. Steve Redgrave is the, a great British rower. He, he won five gold medals for Great Britain, so, and he's got type 1 diabetes. Was he the one that, during the current Olympics? He, he, I think he's... Yes. He, he, uh, he ran with the... Uh, with the Olympic the flame. Yeah, the torch yeah, into yes, the stadium. Yes. He's a legend back, back home. But now, Stephen, you made the transition from a marathon to the ultra marathon. Why, why that step? I think it was just a new challenge. <laughs> I, th I think the marathon became, was becoming a bit too much like looking at my watch every, every mile and checking my split. And there were a lot of, a lot of my friends were, were doing these ultra marathons I'd never heard of until probably two years ago. Really? Chris Solars, who I met uh, last year. Uh, Deanna Colbruff, I know you had on the show. Yes, yes. Uh, Kayla Marino is a very good friend of mine. Uh -huh. uh, she's been doing them longer than me. So there's numerous people that uh, I know in New York. You, you were hanging out with the wrong crowd, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I, I, got, I, I got bullied into something, something harder and uh, more strenuous than a marathon. But obviously you enjoyed it. Well, my first one was a nice easy one. It was the North Face Bear Mountain. One of the most craziest technical terrains I can possibly think of. I've not done anything harder. Again, you probably had to be concerned with your diet doing that, doing that run. But it sounds like you do the normal things, the goose, the Gatorade. Yeah, I mean, a 50K to me, um, it, well, back then, I guess it was a bit harder. I mean, it's only six more miles than a marathon, but because of the terrain, it did take a lot longer. So the food was a, a, a key part of being successful in the race and that obviously affects my diabetes so I was taking um, some crazy things at aid stations the peanut butter jelly sandwiches they had skittles or M&Ms they said w what do you want do you want skittles or M&Ms I said I want both <laughs> so he poured it in one cup and I they're like who is this crazy guy and uh, but it worked again I did a I was doing the pre-blood test and just kind of guessing how I felt throughout the, throughout the race now do a post-blood test and I would normally be like somewhere in the middle, so I was, I was hitting it. I was understanding how to eat and how to stay good with my levels. I forget now. I think it's about 500 people in that race, so I was I was up the front. It was wow. it was good fun. That must have felt great. Did feel really good. It was no, really good. I wanted to ask you something. A photo I saw, and I think they called that England. When you're kneeling, looks like you're exhausted from success. That's the only way I can describe it. It was such a beautiful picture. That's the Marine Corps Marathon. Oh, I love that marathon. The I love marathon. it too. The People's Marathon, yeah. That was just a great race. I went in with a goal of breaking 250. Um, I'd been at a wedding the previous night in Virginia and it, it snowed. And 
I was like, this isn't going well. I'm at a wedding and it's snowing and I've got a race in the morning. I said, this isn't going to go very well. And I luckily went to bed fairly early and I started the first few miles as they're a bit hilly before mm -hmm. Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got into Georgetown, I was doing 618 pace and it felt fine. I was with the lead women and I could watch them, watch that race unfold in front of my eyes. And I just kept that pace the whole time and just crushed my PR by nine minutes. 2.45, <laughs> So it was a sprint. It was a sprint up, up that famous hill at the end uh -huh. to make the 2.45.58. Then just the emotions hit. I just collapsed and and that was a beautiful on the picture. floor. Was that by accident when they took that photo? Well, I was on the floor for a while. Again, I was being a baby and crying about it because to me it was a big deal. Um, and then as I, as I was getting up, there was about 10 or 12 local press photographers all around me. I was kneeling back up to get up and that's when they got the shot. And it was in the press uh, the next day, I think it's the Washington Post. And uh, I... That's the shot that hit the world. And then some friends after that at Philadelphia, Abby and uh, Stephen Beck, they mimicked the pose. <laughs> and uh, it's become a kind of a term amongst our friends, which is, which is great fun. Excellent. Englanding, I love Englanding, it. Englanding, yeah. You know, we're dedicating this, this show to, to your Uncle Dave. Tell us about him. Well, he was a really funny guy. He's just a... a a really, really great uncle. I'm sure everyone says that, but he, but he really was. I mean, it's a shame because in some way that I didn't get to spend as much time with him as I wanted to. Uh, after we left Hong Kong in 1990, uh, he took his family, my uh, Aunt Rosie and my cousin Graham, out to Hong Kong uh, as an engineer to work on all the railway systems and, mm -hmm. and the airport. Mm -hmm. And he was there until he died uh, early this year. So he was there for 22 years in Hong Kong. So our time together was always kind of in different countries. Yeah. Um, but when we did see each other, it was just great. He was, he's a sports guy. Uh, he liked football, he liked cricket. He's just a jokester. Um, just a very, very funny and positive guy and very loving to, to his family and obviously to, to our family too. And it was leukemia that? He had leukemia and, lymph and lymphoma. He had, okay. he had both. Um, he had a few more things than that actually going on. It was eight, eight and a half years battling a lot, a lot of things. And, um, and this is all in Hong Kong? This is all in Hong Kong, yeah. So he got diagnosed, uh, I guess around, I can't do the math, 2005 right, or right, four right. or something. And so, um, and I felt kind of help us after a while. I mean, it, at first it didn't really hit me, and then I was like, this is really bad, and what can I do? I decided to ask him what his favorite charity was, and it was the Leukemia and Lymphoma Research, based in the UK, and uh, so I raised money from the New York City Marathon, um, then it was Chicago, uh, and then it was Boston in 11, and my fourth one, which has just happened, is the uh, was the Leadville Trail 100. They were done in honor of him. We uh, we raised over about eleven thousand dollars in four four events, and uh, I'm really happy that I got to tell him um, that I was doing that race uh -huh. in December uh -huh. before he before he passed away. Oh. So he so he knew about it, and he th thought I was completely crazy. Um, <laughs> but I I'm pretty sure he's uh, he's proud of what uh, what, sorry, what we all he, achieved. Sure he watched over you as he ran the. Uh, these races. Well, tell us about the Leadville 100. I think it's like the second oldest 100 ultra in the country. That's right, yep. Yeah. Second oldest behind Western States 100. So, how I got into that was uh, really through people like uh, Coach T and uh, Chris Solars Bradweiss from my, from my Guinness World Record team. They invited me to a showing of Unbreakable, which is a documentary about Western States. Mm -hmm. And I went to that and was blown away at the beauty and pure endurance of these guys doing this doing this famous course. And uh, it was one where Killian Horne of Salomon was struggling and Jeff Rose ends up winning the race. Mm -hmm. uh, I went home that night and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing one right now, I'm signing up. And that race you, you can't, you have to qualify for. So I said to myself, well, what's, the, what's the next biggest 100 in America? And I'd, I'd read Born to Run by Christopher McDougall, as yeah. many people have run, right. uh, have read. And, uh, and that was open, so I, I went to the website and I thought, oh, it must be really hard to get in. I clicked about three buttons, it said, you're in. For the Leadville? Yeah, and I was like, 
oh my God, what did I do? So I went to bed with cold sweats thinking that was a really bad mistake and a loss of money. I'm never going to do that. And I told some people, I, I told Chris for one, and he said, that's great, that's great. And, uh, and trained for seven months for that, for that race. Excellent. But it, in that training, you probably ran a few 50K and 50 miles. Yeah, I, I, I ran, um, I forget what I ran. I ran two 50 milers. Well, one was a 12 hour uh, race, which was almost 50 miles, and one, one was a 50 miler. And you were coming in either first or you have a streak there, I thought, that you three or four. Were uh, I had a, had a little little spell in May that was pretty, pretty exciting. May, May um, was was the North Face Bear Mountain again, this time the 50 miler. So that went pretty well. I don't know where I placed, but that was a, it was a good race, around seven hours, I think. Uh -huh. um, and then I went to DC for the same event, the North Face, uh, about four weeks later. So, and that was meant to be just a training run, just to get the miles in that day, right. back off the back of Bear Mountain. So I was tired and there was a, a near miss kind of a tornado the night before so again <laughs> another another trip to dc like marine corps and yeah. another bad weather i was like oh god it's gonna it be it's like gonna a be a mess <laughs> in your case and i went down there and uh I, I just went in went in easy and knew what pace i wanted to do i was in fifth place fourth place and uh i was with this guy from from france and uh from the pyrenees in france so he was a real mountain runner and uh he was struggling so i left him and then i turned the corner with about 12 miles to go or something and I saw the top three guys and I knew I knew I'd, I could win I, I knew I, I knew I was going to win okay. I, that sounds a bit big-headed but I'd rein them in and I just felt really good you just felt off their energy okay and, and you were feeling good and I just said good job to the guy and the, the first guy was he couldn't even speak the second guy was being sick and the first guy didn't speak to me <laughs> <laughs> no, they were speechless so he was he was, he was mad so he I just <laughs> I sprinted in and uh, I won by about five minutes and it was unbelievable oh, to, to win have, a race. You must have been on top of the world. Oh yeah, I mean that's the that's the biggest win I've done. And this is before the Leadville one. And that was just, that was a training run. That was a training <laughs> run. So you went into the Leadville 100 feeling pretty good. That helped a lot. That really did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I signed up on my own, thinking I could just do it on my own, which is a huge mistake. Now I've done it. Um, my best friends, uh, Francis Laros, who you know well, Rui Gomez, and Kayla Marino they all came to crew. They said, we're coming, we're going to pace you, we're going to crew. Seems to me the least I can do, they got you involved in this ultra stuff to yeah. begin with. Yeah. Their evil ways. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got them back. And my parents came in from London and we made a trip out of it in Colorado oh. for like a nice like 10 day trip. Well, 100 miles is a lot different from 50 miles. And also I think the altitude there is quite dramatic. It's also the highest uh, ultra marathon in the country. Um, and it's famous for a lot of reasons, but one reason is it's got a very um, low finish rate. 42% is the average, less than one in two. And uh, the altitude is uh, 10,200 at Leadville. It's the highest town in the country. I can't imagine breathing like that. How was that? Well, tell us about it. I was never worried that I couldn't do 100 miles or the, the, the time frame of 30 hours to finish it in. I always thought I could do that distance uh, over that time. It was the altitude of not being that high in my life ever. Nowhere near it. Warming out. You're doing great. You look fantastic. Well, good. Good. Okay, good job. Good day, guys. All right. Good luck, buddy. Because the pace was so slow over that distance, you're walking, you're climbing, you're running, you're stopping. I didn't find it as bad as other people did. I'm not sure if that's because I was there for a week before and I slowly built up uh, that may be the reason, I, I don't know, but it really wasn't a, a big factor for me. And it's a beautiful race. They call it the Race Across the Skies, another nickname for yeah, it. Yeah, Race Across the Skies, uh, it's a great name. And also, um, I really did think about that in terms of my uncle. Um, you know, he was really with me the whole time, especially so so high up in the mountains. It was, it was beautiful. Oh, did you carry any special memento with you? I had a, um, an Uncle Dave, uh, kind of a, a bib it's 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 from the leukemia and lymphoma research charity uh i first used it in 2011 for boston my sister uh she was there she was there and she uh she got the sharpie out and and put his name on it and some other things and uh, i've been using it ever since so that was on the uh on my back 
I asked for a number. I asked for 60. They said, oh, we can't give you 60 because the first 100 numbers is for um, previous Leadville runners. Oh. So I said, well, what can you do? Is You could do 160. Or, well, he made it to 60. That was one of his biggest goals before he died. So I had number 260, so he 260. So I got a personal number. It's pretty cool. The whole time. Oh, my gosh. Wow. What are some of your future challenges? I got some uh, exciting stuff coming up. I've just become a member of uh, Team Type 1, which is a, um, a company based in Atlanta. That it's, a, it's a hundred of the uh, top athletes with, with, with diabetes. And um, it's cyclists, it's runners, it's triathletes. And we travel around the country um, doing these events and we uh, go and see children in hospitals with diabetes, we meet doctors and we do presentations. So I'm gonna be a member of them uh, starting in December. I'm going to California for the uh, uh, Sacramento Marathon. The Sacramento, yeah. Yeah, the California International Marathon okay. is, the, is the real name. So that's my, okay. that's my new team that I'm with. Team Type 1, yep. Great name. And uh, I have Chicago Marathon in two weeks. I've got JFK 50. Uh, in November, which is the 50th anniversary of the oldest 50 miler. Really? So it's oh. going to be a big one. Do you know Oz Perlman? He'll probably be running. Is he friends of Mike Arnstein? Yes, yes. He's doing the Sparta he, Ultra he this week. Oh, he is? I don't know him. I, I know of him. He's a, he's a remarkable author marathoner. Well, if, if they attempt 153 miles, they're remarkable. I'm sure you're going to do very well. JFK 50. Anyway, and what else after that? So next year, Boston is already signed up for in April. Um, I'm hopefully going to, I'm going to apply at least for Western States 100. And I'm also going to apply uh, for the Mont Blanc, the Ultra Trail Mont Blanc, the North Face <laughs> around, uh, well, around Mont Blanc, uh, okay. France, Switzerland and Italy, all in 100 miles. Oh, you got three countries. Three countries, one big loop. It's meant to be the hardest 100 miler in the world. Wow, do you need to carry your passport for these three? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I am playing this one on Chris Sellers again. He's, he's going too. So we agreed we're, we're both going to try and enter that. So oh, he's gonna, he may run that too? He has to. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm not going. So that's, that's the plan. Well, excellent. Well, listen, you're a remarkable person for doing these things and, and appreciating your life. And you've been you're an inspiration. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.